So on today's episode, I am honored to get to talk with someone that I've I admired from afar for a long time as a as a player, um, and then was lucky enough to meet and get to know him uh, and play music occasionally, and just I'm just proud to call him a friend, and I'm just so honored that he is. Uh, on the podcast today, and I can't wait to talk with him about his musical journey and all the really cool stuff he's done. So, without further ado, it's a it's a pleasure to to welcome Matt Mundy to the podcast. Hey, hey Matt. Hey, Brad. What's going on? Thanks for having me. Anybody that'll have me, I'm really really thankful for that. No oh, man, I, it is it is absolutely an honor to uh, to get to talk with you. And I know there are, there's a lot of people out there that are just this big fan of you as I am. And I know they're, they're wow. going to be excited to hear, uh, hear, just hear your words and hear about your journey. So thanks for doing, thanks for being here today. Absolutely. As we're recording this, uh, I think you are, you guys are, are, are you playing a, is it a festival this weekend? I'm on location. You caught me on location here. We're in beautiful Chickamauga, Georgia. It's early, well, late fall, excuse me. It's uh first of September. Excuse me again. First of November, uh, the Chickamauga, anybody that might know where that is, uh, kind of the northeast corner of Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, just beautiful here. You can't imagine the leaves are, I guess, peeking out right now. It is just something. Yeah, we're at a bluegrass festival called Forever Bluegrass. Yeah, we're playing today. At, I think we play a show later this evening. And you're playing... You and Fontana you and Sunset, yeah, with yeah. my mom's, with my my boss slash mom's band <laughs> up here, yeah. And you're playing some with you playing with your brother too. Mark's sitting in with us today. Yeah, Mark's got the bluegrass chops. He just don't <clears throat> always, you know. I think he leaned more towards the dark side. Yeah. <laughs> if it hadn't been for Eddie Van Halen, he Eddie probably Van, well, Eddie Van Halen could play a G run. I guarantee <laughs> right. you that. It I wouldn't be too it. hard. I guarantee it. So yeah, we're up here and we'll we'll get started. There's some good bands playing and, and here again just a beautiful location up here. Yeah. Yeah, I saw a video this morning of of the that area where you all are playing and I was just mm. knocked out by the just the property and uh yeah, that's that's pretty awesome. How many bands are playing? You know what? I'm not 100 probably 8 or 10 a day. There was bands yesterday. We seen a band called the Junior Sisk band uh last night man alive I'm, my hair still parted it was just awesome it was they junior says he's from virginia he's the real deal always got a top-notch band with him and um yeah so we it's kind of a <clears throat> we we always enjoy getting to see the bands uh when we play the festivals we're always excited to see you don't you don't get to see them all year round so once or twice a year you get to see a good bluegrass band somewhere yeah how uh, how many how much are you pl- getting to play these days? A fair amount, I, probably thirty thirty days a year, something like that. Okay, and then of course the rehearsals and practices on each side of that's always just as fun as the gig. Absolutely. So we we stay we stay fertile, I guess you might say. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering about how you start. I mean, obviously you you come you come from a, an incredibly deep musical family right from several generations on my mom's side yeah yeah my dad's side had some stride piano going on church stuff um but i don't i don't know of any uh musical roots especially the appalachian music and mountain music as we'd call it <clears throat> mom's side however had had a lot of that going on directly with me would have been my great grandfather uh, he was a fiddle player my uncle gary's and and grandmother's uh, father Felton Looper. He was a looper, and uh, from what we understand, at the turn of the century, he was probably playing by the 1900 or so. Uh, born in 1890, old time fiddle player, and he um, he uh, played till probably not until he passed, but pretty darn close. He passed in 79, so he was on up there in age, and and that's as far back as I know of it where it was but that's a long way <laughs> that's a long way was that in uh were they already in georgia or were they somewhere else i think so i think so i think most of the roots are from forsyth and dawson county georgia there was i think he lived in oregon for a while i don't know what that was maybe he was a novelty kind of guy and liked to I think he took pictures 
he got into the photography when photography was coming along there and for some reason moved to Oregon. We don't understand that. And uh, when he came back, I guess they settled in, in Dawson County, which is north of Forsyth County, 10, 15 miles or so. Yeah. Well, and then your your grandfather. That's just, right. I mean, I, I was just talking to a friend of mine a couple of days ago who – his name is Bill Cunningham. He's a steel guitar player that lives right. in the area, and his dad was Howard Cunningham, which I'm sure you may oh, know. Oh wow! From the from uh, from the fair, how was yeah. the fair? Sure, yeah. He he's he's uh, I'm familiar. Yeah, Barry, speaking of the fair, Barry Palmer, Barry Palmer. I, I knew of all, all those years. And that's where I would know Howard, Howard Cunningham from. Yeah, I uh, I've known Barry my enti- almost my entire life. How about as that? It turns out, yeah, but. But Bill and I were talking a couple of days ago, and he was talking about your uh, your grandfather being a steel guitar player. Yeah, Pop was a dobro player. Yeah, <clears throat> all my life, and I don't think he learned till later in life. As a matter of fact, which was still before I was born, uh, he was like thirty thirty or so before he picked up an instrument and um, mastered the dobro. In my opinion, he sounded just like Josh Graves. If you're familiar mm-hmm. who Josh Graves was, that was his style. Of course, at that time, that was probably the only style. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe there's Bashful Brother Oswald and some more things. Yeah, but yeah, he uh, that was on my uh, mom's my mom's dad. Yeah, uh, and then you know, obviously Francis. You know, for for everybody listening who knows Francis, and then people that don't. I mean, she is uh, she is quite a force in the bluegrass. All world. my life, yeah. That's the first things I remember hearing was bluegrass music. Yeah, my dad played some, but I think only after they got together, he learned a few chords on the guitar and and, and got pretty good. Uh, of course, they went through the old divorce and uh, the D word, and he didn't continue to play. and And it was just her life, you know. So that's what she really enjoyed doing, as yeah. we all as we all find ourselves bitten by that bug. But she was she started playing guitar, I think, when she was a teenager, and then picked up the bass when a bass was needed maybe in a jam session or something and took to it. And it, is, it stands right now uh, today as good as anybody bass player, bluegrass bass player. I know. You I, know. I totally agree. And, and, and a singer too. And as somebody who plays bass and sings it, it's, there's a little bit of a, a mental gymnastic that has to happen to be able to play in the beat Mm-hmm. And, and then sing. do something interesting vocally at the same time. Sing, right, right. Not just sing, but sing well. Yeah. Right. And she does that really well. And uh, Well, I think that's uh, not only to understand the bluegrass beat, but, but to actually like it too, right? Mm-hmm. So she likes that music, and it, therefore the music she can do automatically. Yeah. That makes sense. And the vocals, uh, vocals, she can then concentrate more on vocals. Yeah. In... And I don't play a lot of bluegrass, very little, actually. But I'm curious about that. I disagree. I've heard you play some bluegrass. Oh uh, well, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, beautiful tenor voice. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, I know if you're playing in a band with a drummer, I mean, I know how <laughs> you know everybody, everybody's role and listening and to kind of gauge where the who's responsible for the tempo and the groove and how does that how does that work more in the bluegrass world or is is that responsibility kind of moved around to different instruments or is it kind of fall on the bass ish, player or the ish i think it's uh it's it's you you equate the bass drum and the snare to a, a bass and a mandolin chop mm-hmm. right so right. You, you got this this one two three four thing going on so you got one three bass two four chop and the guitar, of course, there's exceptions to the rule, mind you. But the guitar fills in, I guess, like cymbals would maybe in the in the middle in there. The banjo got the roll going on. I think is the um, basic pattern. And there's exceptions to that. If a mandolin's playing a, a break solo, a lot of times the banjo will do what the mandolin was doing in percussion, which is the chop. Right. I guess they call it something different, vamp, like a vamp. Mm-hmm. So who come up with this? I don't know. So I'm not a bluegrass music scholar. If I would, I wouldn't be sitting here. I would be at a school teaching it. So <laughs> <laughs> nowadays there's a lot of schools for this, but we, we always go back to when Flat and Scruggs joined Bill Monroe. I think the rhythm in general took on a different 
feel and different pull, push and pull as it had been previously. Yeah. Right. Because Bill's music before that would have been the brother style with the Monroe brothers, which was wide open, mind you, really, really driving stuff. But you didn't really, I think Bill, for instance, on his mandolin playing, played more of a strummy rhythm than the chop. And I don't know if when the band, uh, what they call the 1946 band with Flatt and Scruggs, the year that that started, had anything to do with his mandolin chop becoming a, a, a t- 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 like this as opposed to a strum. But yeah, more like a percussive kind of yeah, thing. I yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't know. But but I'll 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 go back to your initial question talking about the bass is the bass hasn't changed. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> the bass is still playing. Basses can do that right now, and and millions of different forms of music can be valid and be. Uh, you're great. You sound great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. If you play on the beat and play the right note, you you're going to probably stay employed. <laughs> you got the gig. Yeah. Yeah. And bluegrass, that's the same as a tenor singer. <clears throat> There's not, you know, bluegrass has, has the high lonesome sound, if you will. But that tenor singer, if you got a good tenor singer, they can be half <clears throat> whatever, if you will, at playing an instrument but if he can sing he pulls the difference and, and yeah. makes the band sound great yeah as we were just talking before we started recording about ricky skaggs i mean i think about those he himself is is as good of a tenor singer as ever been in bluegrass music period or any music for that matter but his tenor he could have been a mandolin player and tenor singer in bluegrass and never done anything else and he would have been you know the stature that he is now within that yeah top notch yeah, it's interesting to see how those guys have went on to have very successful careers that crossed over out of bluegrass into mainstream country music and and still, you know, I would say Ricky more than anybody stayed still stayed true to the way he sang even yeah. when he was a country singer. Agreed. Yeah. They sound like I said he's like, he sounds like a a, a 83-year-old man at a at a country store in eastern kentucky yeah. singing on sunday morning <laughs> yeah that's right how does that work for you yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were talking about the you know the academic part of it a minute ago I, it's funny mm. i just had someone on the podcast recently who had gone through uh kind of an a, acoustic slash bluegrass program that they're teaching at berkeley now who would have thought who would have thought who would have thought that you could go to Boston and go to Berkeley and study. I think study. it's listed as an old time program, mm-hmm. but Bluegrass falls, I guess, within the parent. I guess old time is the parent to Bluegrass, maybe. I don't. Yeah. I don't know if that sounds right, but yeah, uh, Berkeley. So some of the best players in Bluegrass these days: Molly Tuttle's, um, Sierra Holes, and and there's Sarah Jarosz. <coughs> Sarah think. went yeah. went to Berkeley and graduated yeah. from Berkeley. Yeah, all came through there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, used to be a, just, now you'd know better. Than I, it used to be just a jazz school. Is that right? Was Berkeley yeah, just jazz a jazz and school? Rock players, you know. The I mean, business side of it. Yeah, the, yeah, the the audio production side of it. Mm-hmm. A lot of uh, engineers come. You know, a lot of record engineers come through there. Right. But it is. It has evolved to. I think just and maybe it's to stay i mean obviously keep more people coming to their school but i think them you have to you don't just apply or even get a scholarship well maybe if you get a scholarship you get around this from my understanding you have to submit a video of yourself or play and you have to audition to go to school there so you have to be of, of caliber to even attend you know yeah which i thought was pretty interesting yeah. You can't I, buy your way into that school. You cannot. You cannot. <laughs> you can you not you can't fake it till you make it at right. going into Berkeley. No. You 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 have to have some Well, going back then you had the 70s some of the greatest what Mike Stern uh did Pat Metheny he Pat just taught there. I mean you you're talking about yeah. big big dogs and jazz that went there so now big dogs and bluegrass are backing that up. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's really interesting to see how that how that program has evolved to bring in this new era of acoustic music. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, and I, I'm, you know, I don't know if other 
big schools or conservatories around. And I, you know what? I, I'm going to actually fact check myself right now because actually Sarah Jarosz went to New England Conservatory. She did not go to Berkeley. I, I correct myself oh, on well, that. Well, excuse, um, me. excuse you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, I apologize if you, if you hear this. Uh, I, I, you, I'm somewhat friends with Sam Grisman now via internet and stuff. We texted back and forth. David Grisman's son. I think he went there. Uh, you've got all the uh, Dominic Leslie, Molly Tuttle's, about half of Molly Tuttle's band, for that matter. Maybe they all met there. Not sure. So they've got a kinship. Yeah, that's great. Uh, the college bluegrass boys and girls. The college yeah, mountain that's right. boys. That's exactly right. <laughs> it's a thing. It is a thing. Uh, so what was your first instrument? Did, did you start on guitar or mandolin? Uh, you know what? I'll back all the way up. I was about eight or nine. Uh, there was clogging also, mm-hmm. right, in the family. And so all my aunts, while my uncles and, and mom, of course, were playing bluegrass, they were clogging. They had real formal troops, if you will, of clogging troops. And uh, so I guess clogging was was eight or nine, my first little foray into anything other than chasing girls. <laughs> and uh, that didn't last long, and I'll explain that real quick, is because I couldn't do the dang routines. Because I had some few moves. I had some moves, but the routines, you you know, you had to do this move here, then you're going to move into this dance step, and this, and then you're going to wiggle in a line. And I just could not grab hold that for nothing. And so, I, so it's funny you bring this up, and I hadn't thought about this in many years. I did the same thing when I was about that age. Wow. And so you learned, you learned how a triplet works over, uh, over four, four times. Right that's there. exactly right. That, that's what I, I kind of feel too. That, that really goes deep into you liking it. You know, I did like it. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Looking at, looking back at it at the time, I was like, yeah, I'm never going to figure this out. But looking <laughs> back on it, 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 what a, what a great experience we probably both got yes. into rhythm, right? Yes. Yes. You're a drummer too. I know that. Yes. I'm not a drummer. I understand the mandolin chop a little bit, but, but that the, the clogging, I don't think uh, somebody said somewhere sometime that it does come back to dance. You know, a lot of it does come back to dance, you know? So I think by taking that in it, it, maybe I have good timing, maybe not, but it did help. It put timing in me, I guess you might say. Yeah. So therefore then moving on fast forward a year or so, I worked for the uh, animal control division of Forsyth County, which was playing the fiddle. So if you played fiddle, you wouldn't have any stray cats around. Is what it amounted <laughs> to. So I took up. <laughs> I said, "Hey, I'm in sixth, fifth grade here. I can learn. I can get a job playing fiddle and run cats away." Is what it amounted <laughs> to. So my uncle showed me some fiddle. Boil the cabbage down. Uh, fire on the mountain. What was some more? Old Joe Clark. Um, some of those cluck old hens, some of those tunes. And I got, I think I would love to hear a tape of it. I bet it was okay. I bet it was okay. Cause then remember, you know, thinking back, well, I do remember learning the tunes and I do remember catching on with the shuffle of the bow and how that shuffle is doing a certain thing over and over again. But you can, by moving and putting your fingers on the fingerboard at certain times within that shuffle, it subdivides that shuffle. So you're not hearing that. Dun, 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 you, you know, you can put all kinds of notes within that and that, you know, you can make a lot of music with this one bow move with this mm-hmm. shuffle. So I would like to hear that. I bet it was okay, but I didn't really take to it. I just, it just didn't, I, maybe because the fiddle was so close to my ears. I've, I've thought about that. Well, why didn't I stick with, well, maybe it was just too brittle. For, for my ears or something just didn't like it <laughs> would be one way to say uh okay long story short so my uncle gary looper was kind of the patriarch of music in our family he was equally good on everything great great musician and uh <clears throat> real sub note gary had got got cancer well we had a music store later on in life and gary went for cancer treatments and he would come to the music store on the way home from these cancer treatments looking like a zombie and he'd go in there and pick a fiddle up or pick a banjo up and play it and it just joyed us to death to see that knowing that he loved music that much yeah, and yeah you know he just he loved it he just loved it so anyway gary was our teacher all about all of this and uh, so gary had a <laughs> kind of funny had a double case that had his mandolin and his fiddle in it so he was teaching me one day, and I just reached over and grabbed his mandolin, 
And um, it just felt more natural. I picked his mandolin up and I said, well, wait a minute. This is easy. It's, it's another 12 inches from my ears. <laughs> and the, it just, the, the wrist made more sense to me. And the notes are the same. I don't know if you know violin and yeah. mandolin. Mandolin is, is the old redheaded stepchild to violin, in case you <laughs> didn't know that. Both from Italy, but violin seemed to get a little more notoriety down through the years. But I always tell the funny story. The the double case was really heavy, so it had, had a mandolin and his fiddle in it, and it weighed ten pounds. It weighed fifteen any given day, depending on what what liquid he had in there. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> it <laughs> might weigh just a little bit extra right there, you know. <laughs> but Gary was tops to all of us. I mean, he never never had enemies. He was just just a great person, and we miss him. The old COVID bud took, took Gary out. Oh, yeah. yeah. Real sad. Real sad. But, yeah, Gary was our teacher. I guess, so Madeline, come on. I, I was in sixth, about sixth grade, something like that, when I took to it. Yeah, and went through phases, as a lot of us do. I think I heard Tony Rice say this, too, which is, of course, my hero. Um, uh, of my generation, there was nobody any more prevalent than Tony Rice. But anyway, uh that went through phases. So you'd pick it up, you'd practice a little bit. Ah, it's okay. But then you'd get with your buddies or you'd go to a jam or something. You play all night, right? Play all night. Well, then, then you might not play again for a couple, three days and pick a little bit and pick a little. But then I'd go through phases where I did practice quite a bit. So I think up until the time I was probably 10th grade would be about the time it really bit me to where it was what I wanted to play a lot. Yeah. Every weekend, mornings before school, that type of thing, get it out of the case and make sure it's in tune from the night before. And maybe it would be, maybe it wouldn't be. Uh, so about that time, I really took to it. I yeah. was in bands pretty much the whole time, too. I started, I think the first band would have been, I actually, the first band was Indian Summer with my mom. Uh, her band in, in about 82, I guess, with Frank Lee and, and Mindy Rakestraw. Okay. Yeah. And and stayed in bands all through high school, which is where you learn. I swear, I, you you can you can practice your scales all you want to, but you need to get in there with with people who are like minded or not like minded, or just make music with people. That's where you learn. I totally agree. Yeah, I, it is. You can you can sit at home and you can practice with a metronome. You can play along with. And a, I wished I would have had. I wished I would have had done that, which I didn't. Well, listen, you. You're you have amazing time. <laughs> you have amazing feel. So whatever you did, I it, it worked, man. I promise. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. It's I've I've been lucky right out out the bat. Mom was a good bass player with time, and my uncle mentioned Gary. And any time that you come from a family of music, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah, you know i i don't I don't take any of that because I came from a musical family too and grew up in jam sessions with my family and the whole thing. And I don't take any of that for granted, but I do wish I could go back and tell myself, remember all these moments because I wouldn't yes. trade anything for those. Yes. Well, I feel like I'm living one now playing in the band with mom. That yeah. being said. Absolutely. That's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my what papa a- was real, real super. I mentioned my papa Roy. He was, he was super nice to all of us. As a matter of fact, generationally, but he would, uh, it, He'd call, you going with me? I'm going to play tonight and that type. Every Saturday night. He was a Saturday night, Sunday morning guy. So he every Saturday night he was playing music somewhere, and Sunday he was in church. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the style. That's, yeah. that's the way to lead your life, in my opinion.
did you and Mark play a lot as teenagers? Not a lot. We played we played a lot more in the in the past five years probably than we did in the previous thirty. I would bet on that. Uh, not a lot because like a, there again, Mark he he took to to liking. Um, like in the, the, the hair, <laughs> I'll throw them under the bus, the hair bands. Mark was a hair band guy. You know, I yeah. would not, I don't think I would ever went to a poison concert in my life had it not been for Mark, <laughs> for Mark liking, you know, Van Halen poison. Mind you, good music. You know, I just yeah. said, what well, I wouldn't have crossed paths with that, but he, he took to that and later than country Mark's Mark's a mm-hmm. country guy, as you know, yeah, Elf played a lot of music together. Yeah. So not a lot. And, and, uh, I think probably within the last 10 years, we've, we've done quite a bit of gigs together and we, we did an album together. I guess it was five or six years ago, uh, appropriately titled mandolin and guitar, by the way. And I had to arm wrestling to, to put mandolin in front of guitar, but that's the way it went. <laughs> mandolin and guitar, not guitar and mandolin. You see. Well, I love him to death, but it does have a better ring to it. I think so, so too. I think yeah. so. It's classy. <laughs> it's classy. Classy. So Mark, 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 come back around to bluegrass later in life, but he took right to it, and he's got the right lick for it. Yeah, You've, yeah. I heard somebody say there's a bluegrass guitar rhythm lick that's like a pork chop lick. That's wrong. It's <laughs> it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be two and four, but there's this these guitar players. Dun, 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 dun. It gets it just drives me crazy. And Mark, thank God, Mark does not have that. He he plays bluegrass rhythm guitar. And I will say that, and I'm I'm sure growing up with a great bass player as a mom, y'all yes. both have really sound solid rhythm and i'm in and, and mark and you you're both great solo players but your rhythm to me is i think i enjoy listening to that as much as anything else uh because it's so solid i teach mandolin i've got a handful of students i keep and um they buy my tennis shoes by the way so that explain that'll explain <laughs> you to that real quick but I, t- I tell them, oh, they want to play this tune. Okay, we'll we'll learn this tune. We'll learn your little uh, 12 bars of this tune, your solo. The tune's three minutes long, but you're going to learn this. Okay, fine. What are you going to do for the rest of the song? Are you going to play the, the, the – Jerry over here is playing banjo break. You, what are you going to play? <laughs> oh, I'm going to play – no, you're not going to play your solo while he's playing. You're going to play rhythm. You're going to play timing. You're going to play a part. You remember blocks in school. Can you can you do this? Well, this guy over here's doing something different. So without rhythm, we ain't doing too good in life, you know. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, it's funny you bring that up as I'm hearing you talk about that. It I would argue that the moments that are not happening in the solo, what a player does is what ultimately keeps them employed, right? <laughs> Period. Yes. Yes. You know. Uh, how being a team player and staying out of the way and, yep. and supporting somebody while they're having that moment uh, playing a fill or a solo. Yeah. That's that. That's where I the, sit and watched a mandolin player with Mitch and junior sis band last night. I watched him as close as I could watch. I get distracted. The the banjo player hits a hot lick or something. You look, but I tried to watch, you know, watched him several songs, just playing his just chopping, just rhythm. That's so important. So important yeah. the, the the concentration that leads to Zen to, mm-hmm. that leads to the I'm not thinking about it. Therefore, what is that? That's the feel, right? So it's right. like like climb you three steps, yeah. Climb you three steps, if you will. But yeah, I, I mean it's uh, it's everybody. All my heroes say it say it too. It's it's just as fun to play rhythm as it is to play your your hammer on Eddie Van Halen stuff. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, I don't think he played rhythm. Let's let's dwell on that a second. I, maybe Eddie Van Halen was not a rhythm guitar player. <laughs> he might have been just what, what is it, a lead a lead guitar player. He, That's a thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and, right. And maybe maybe it was just maybe Michael Anthony was the rhythm player in that uh, band. <laughs> as solid as a rock. He was. Yeah. Shoe. No, and I had agree. a high voice too. Come to think of it, he had, yeah. Oh, he was screaming high 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 reach. I I agree. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, we don't we don't get too far in any form of music 
uh, and or life. Like there again, you know, you've got to ha- understand what's going on in any situation. And music's just one of those. That's exactly. It. Yeah, you could you could you could parallel that with anything relationships with uh, any type of job that yes. the the support role is. It's where the that's where the security is. You know, it is. It is. I've been. I've always wanted to ask you about your how the opportunity came with you playing with Wendy Bagwell, and 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 how when when did that happen, and how how was that experience? Well, that's a good question. Uh, well, Wendy called me. Someone, if I'm mistaken, Steve Thomason, who's a local. Do you know Steve? I do know Steve. Steve's yes. a media guy. Steve's yes. a media guy. I guess you're you're a media guy also, I, mm-hmm. but um. Steve was playing guitar with him and you were hired as a multi-instrumentalist and I really wasn't a multi-instrumentalist, but Steve played guitar, maybe some mandolin and this, that, and the other. And so Steve had, had gave him my number. I really don't know how he got information that, you know, that I may be interested in how it would lead to it or whatever. But anyway, so Wendy just called me and said, would you come for a tryout? I would love to hire you. I'll pay you this much per day. And <laughs> I will just out of high school. I, I was okay to that. It was plenty. And uh, they were in a bus, drove in a bus. They, and little did I know that they were Hall of Fame gospel and, and Southern gospel. They were a big deal. Wendy Bagel and the Sunlighters. So I went and tried out not knowing a thing about Southern gospel music. I don't think I knew who J.D. Sumner was without, you know, understanding it was Elvis's bass singer. That was right. about it. So I tried out, and I just remember I didn't play three notes. I mean, it just seemed like we played a song or two, and we're leaving Friday, be here at this time and such and such time, and, and you got it, more or less, is what they said. So it was really, <laughs> it wasn't Berkeley, we'll put it that way, <laughs> for those of you paying attention out there. So I loved it. It's the first time in my life I'd ever played at a Fox theater for 5,000 people. You know, the quartet shows, this would have been 88. The quartet shows, a lot of times they were three or four bands playing at these different venues. So the crowds were pretty large. The crowds were pretty hefty. And man, what music. Man, what I I should say music. Music's great, but the singing is just, I mean, you know, if if you're not a saved soul in in Christianity, you would be after seeing some of those quartet shows because it really knocked you out. Yeah, what was how? What was the instrumentation in 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 the in so, his band? So Kevin Williams tried out the same day I am I did and got the job also. So Kevin, short short bio of Kevin is he spent the last thirty plus years with the Bill Gaither show as and I'm pretty sure a lot of that as as music director. You know, Kevin Williams plays guitar and does a lot of comedy bits with Bill on their show and stuff like that. So Kevin was the guitar player, other musician for me. I played mandolin and some rhythm guitar with Wendy. And uh, so they had a computer system that was primitive by today's standards, but it played a, a, a really scaled down drum thing and bass. So he would basically hit a button, a start button, and it'd start the rhythm and and it would give you a click in. So then Kevin would play his electric guitar, and I would we were playing to that. And Wendy played rhythm guitar. 
So okay. it was it was half and half. A lot of gospel bands use tracks. I think what they call tracks. So they just come out. It's the world's cheapest band, right? You just <laughs> put, hit play, and but we were like half and half. So the lead playing essentially was live, and then the the bass and the um, keyboards and drums were programmed. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I pl- so I played in a gospel group years ago that it was the same kind of thing, but it was basically the rhythm section was live and mm-hmm. everything else was tracks on top of it fiddle well, that, harmonica steel that guitar would be hard so so did you, did you hear a click track was there mm-hmm. a, like a click going on yeah and we were playing with in ears and this was this was very early on i would say playing live with wearing like earbuds or headphones or anything like right. that and uh yeah you would it was essentially they had taken the tracks and just muted the rhythm section and wow did the the export of so it. So all of a sudden y'all were y'all were playing rhythm underneath and, and you'd hear Stuart Duncan up there playing fiddle or something. Yeah. Yeah. And it was <laughs> all right. Hey, and it was all recorded in Nashville. So it was I mean the play I Top think notch. Kelly Back was playing guitar maybe and wow. some of those really good you know, there's a lot of good Nashville players that primarily play on a lot of those gospel, mm-hmm. Southern gospel records. And yeah, it was it was really good. So back to Wendy, I, I was familiar with Canaan records. So as we all do when we're growing up listening to music, you, you turn the record around, see what label it was on, what mm-hmm. players were on it. And that was the privilege, right? It that sure was, was half the game. So I was familiar with Canaan records. Canaan was, and Word, I think it was mm-hmm. Canaan Word being the parent company. Uh, so I was familiar. So I, f- I had a quick sense of pride. Well, these guys are Wendy Bagel and Sunlight. Like, hey, that's obviously a pretty cool little outfit to be involved with. Yeah. So then we got to play some of the shows, played with what was had just become the Whites. It was Buck White and the Down Home folks when I was coming up. Wow. So Jerry Douglas had left, but got to play some shows. Uh, Terry Gibbs. You remember Terry Gibbs? Played sure- some shows with Terry Gibbs at the time. Just Somebody's knocking. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, but... Wow, what a voice. What a voice. What a voice. More talent than just somebody's knocking, Yeah, if you will. Yeah. Yes, and then, of course, all the top. I won't tell some of the stories, but some of them were pretty funny, but got to see play shows with some of the quartets that were just legendary. The yeah. Stamps. Um, what was it? Gold City was really hot mm-hmm. at the time. I remember the Cathedrals. Yeah. Kingsman. Kingsman, I remember the Kingsman, them being yeah. top-notch. Yeah. You know, Kevin Albertson, who we both know. Drummer. You know, he played with Gold City for a, quite a while. Wow. Yeah, back in the, I guess, maybe the mid-2000s he did. Wow. We When I was a kid, my, my, I used to go everywhere with my grandparents. They would take me to Hiawassee to the Georgia Mountain Fair, but we would also go down to the Joyful Noise. I don't know if you I remember that. I played there, sure. Dinner Club. Dinner Club Dinner down in like Club. East Point. Gospel Dinner Club. What about that? Yeah. Um, that was a cool place. Cool place. We always, when I was a kid, we would go everywhere to hear the Lewis family. That's Why where not? We, yeah. Why and, not? Uh, and that was that was probably my first memories of hearing bluegrass music was here in the Lewis family mm-hmm. and uh hallelujah turnpike that was yeah one of that's right <laughs> yeah i remember yeah well little roy to this day gives 100 percent of everything he's got on stage he, he sure really does. goes the he's the wayne newton of bluegrass music if you will. <laughs> i mean every bit of it and he plays sure great he's in yeah. his 80s now it sounds still so i think the rest maybe there's couple of them one or two of them still of the ladies no one of them still alive but the other couple have passed on uh, but yeah they what's funny about their instrument they had a bass a banjo guitar and a tambourine one of the ladies played and it sounded like an orchestra yeah i mean it sounded like 30 instruments up there yeah just and- the click i guess of playing every day pretty much they traveled more than anybody they traveled a tremendous amount yeah and they're from that part of like very east Georgia near like Lincolnton, I think Lincolnton. is where they're from. They talk uh, different there. They it's talk right. Really, and that's what I was really strange say. accent there. Really strange accent. And it you could hear it in the way they sang. There and, you go. and but that family harmony was just so interesting that their brand of it was different from I think than what you would hear a lot of other groups do. The girls sounded like a pipe organ. They sounded mm-hmm. like one thing. Completely agree. Yeah. Great stuff. How was that? Looking back on that now, that experience of touring with Wendy, what do you think that did for your playing? Was that did it 
did did you leave that experience feeling like wow I've come a long way in this? You time? know what? I don't think so. I think I I, I think playing. I, I was with Wendy just short of two years, just short of two years. It had been eighty to almost eighty eight to almost ninety right in that that time period. I don't I don't think that I cha- you know I wasn't working on half diminished scales. I wasn't working on whole tone patterns from a five to a, <laughs> a right. one or or anything like that i think but i think the overall experience of of being in a professional quote quote professional outfit professional band that toured and had respect among their peers that's probably what i took most from it yeah because the, the, the solos were all pretty much always the same they had something worked out on on everything and there was never any hot so i think we did what was the old um to get to Canaan's land, I'm on my mm-hmm. Canaan's land. We'd do that, and that had a couple of mandolin breaks in it, that type thing. And we did a little Jan sang a really pretty song. Um, Someone rolled the stone away. Was it a thief? What was the name of that song? She sang a, a slower song that was really pretty, an Easter based song, and um, played, had really pretty mandolin on it. I don't know who really? played it, probably Hoot Hester. You know, Hoot Hester, the great fiddle player, he yes. also did a lot of mandolin overdubs. He probably played it on the album, but I made a pretty solo where he had done something kind of just bland, a little fancier, so every night. But I, I pretty much stayed to the book on that one, maybe change a note or two yeah. for solos. So no, yeah. I, w- I would have to say no, not really hot picking with that band, but yeah. respected nonetheless. Well, and, and probably, again, Getting a lot of experience just playing to the song, right? And period, and being a team. Yeah, and you talk about that. timing. Well, I mean, you call it mundane if you will, but the computer, bass, and drums. That's like practicing with a metronome an hour each night, right there. So. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So when you, when you, I'm, I'm assuming that that it ended, and was it around that time? Did you start playing with Bruce? Uh yeah. It would have been How did you meet Bruce? Spr- well, Bruce is a character. He's, yeah, so, Bruce Hampton. Yes. So I played in a pickup little deal with uh, my brother. Mark was playing bass, and Scott Vestal, a very pretty hot banjo player and a buddy of mine, Jeff Autry, I've played in several bands with down through the years. We had a little new acoustic thing, if you will, which is basically to say bluegrass without singing. You know, instrumental David Grisman things. Uh, Strength in Numbers was popular at the time, so we tried to get together and we had a little band. Excuse me. So we got asked by Jeff. I think it's Jeff Mosier asked Scott to to come and open for this band that he was in. Jeff Mosier was the original banjo player in the Aquarium Rescue Unit, and uh, so we we obliged. We didn't know their music at all. Didn't know who Bruce Hampton was. So we go down and open up for them. There's seven people in the crowd. Why, you know, why do y'all need an opening band? <laughs> You've got seven people, and you know, we probably drew three of those. <laughs> so anyway, long long story. I can't really make it too short. But anyway, so we we do that. And so Jeff Mosier, I met Bruce that night. By the way, that would have been late '89, probably probably late '89. And he was sitting at the bar, you know, looks like a movie star, but not, uh, <laughs> talked like a musician, but, but not, uh, had nice looking hair, but, but not, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it there. <laughs> but very engaging person, you know, so he did, you know, but then they played after we played and I'd never seen anything like that. That would have been the Aquarium Rescue Unit's original band, which, um, was, was O'Teal, Jeff, uh, Bruce, Jeff Mosier, and Charlie Williams playing guitar. He's a great uh, gypsy jazz guitar player in Atlanta. And Count Mubutu was playing mm-hmm. percussion. I do remember that. But Bruce had a rotating cast. I mean, he had uh, always having different players come. It, it wasn't like a set band, although I think that was the core at the time. And uh, I'd never seen anything like it. You know, Mark and I both were there just like, what in the world? It was good. But it flowed. You was into this song. All of a sudden, they they had did flowed into another song. I have never listened to the Grateful Dead. If I were one hundred percent honest, and I will be right now, I've, I'm not a fan. Um, to to just show my colors here, but that's what it put me in the mindset of having later discovered Grateful Dead a little bit. Was that it floated from one song to another? It didn't really have a theme. Then all of a sudden, they were playing a song. Yeah, and then all of a sudden they were playing something faster in a different time where the guitar player was playing. It was like um, 
a chameleon of music. I don't know if that makes any sense. So I was just, I loved it. I thought it was so awesome. So anyway, cut cut to a month or so later, and Jeff Mosier, the banjo player, also was getting a lot of corporate gigs in Atlanta on the side, or maybe on the front for that matter, because there were seven people at the aquarium show. So there you go. <laughs> uh, so he called, want me to come play mandolin and the uh, different things he had going on playing at the, playing for conventions and that type thing. So I had met at Jeff's house to meet them to go to the gig, and Jeff Autry was actually going with us. And Bruce was there, and he just told me to come down, I think it was a Monday night or something, to the pub there in Little Five Points, which is not Bel Air if you, if, for all you friends out there. <laughs> so I go down to Little, Little Five Points and that Monday and sat in, and I, it was great. Just had never experienced anything like that. Yeah, and so that uh, then he asked me to come play Athens the next day or two. So I went, and it just kind of I became part of the rotating cast of players, I guess that that kind of developed into what people recognize as the Aquarium Rescue Unit. But there was there was a legitimate uh, Aquarium Rescue Unit before I joined the band. Yeah, they just played locally, if you will, Atlanta. And I, honest, and and those that may not know the breakup of the band. You know, I quit first of the five that ended up being in, but Bruce quit shortly after. I think Bruce was happier in Atlanta. He was happier being just a small, small, um, small, what is it you say, big fish in a small pond type mm-hmm. thing. I think he was just happier playing locally. The way I always think of Bruce, of, of that band, it's it's like if Frank Zappa had grown up in the South or something. It, it It's like this... That yeah. same kind of thing, you know what I mean? I, I think I don't know if he was influenced by Frank Zappa. I do know that he was on one of Frank Zappa's albums as, as backup singer. The whole band was. I and I don't know Frank Zappa's music. I don't. I'd be speaking wrong. But I, I, my understanding is that he was on them and actually tried out to be in Frank's band, to which didn't work out for one reason or the other. I don't know if Bruce was Bruce was really influenced by the blues. You know, Bruce, mm-hmm. Bruce loved the blues music. Yeah, and and R and B. Otis Redding, uh, anything that had that little sizzle to it. Uh, of course, BB King, Bobby Blue Bland was his favorite singer. You know, anything that had that little, uh, I, I, I don't know, jump. What you call it, the Chicago blues, where it just had a little pop to it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Not, not yeah, necessarily like the blues, Mississippi, yeah. Mississippi stuff, but more of a pop, more of a bounce. I guess the horn yeah. sections going, that type thing. Cooking, yeah. what you'd say, cooking music. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I've always I've always wondered about your playing. I mean, because I'm sure you you've heard this many times from many people, and I've heard stories of people telling you about your playing with with him. But I would say you you kind of redefined that in, your instrument, and it, it for maybe changed the course for a lot of people with what you played when you were in that band. Maybe. And I just. There was just so much harmonic stuff going on when you played, and and I've always wondered: Were you doing a lot of studying of music theory? Were you just playing? Were you, were you just listening to a lot of deep jazz players? Where, where did all that stuff come from? Because uh, you know, that's amazing. That, that, that goes back to early what we was talking about a while ago: playing in a band. Mm-hmm. So if you're privileged to get in a band with musicians that are of that caliber. That's going to rub off on you, and if if it don't just rub off on you, the heat of having to step up your game a little bit, and 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 reach out and try to learn some of the language of harmony and and rhythm of what they're doing, you know that's going to happen naturally. So to answer your question, I didn't do a lot of studying; it was more or less playing. You know, yeah. I I don't think right now I could tell you a lot of the different the harmonies and scales and chord patterns that were used in that band but uh, you know I, I figured out a little little niche in there yeah and, and what was going on but it was also playing with the drums i <laughs> jeff site is a monster i monster. mean uh, just outstanding at any music so you can take this beat this beat all these different styles and he was able to to deliver them convincingly and great just a great drummer. So having that underneath you doesn't hurt one thing. That's exactly right. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, what what a what a net to have under you, right? Yes. As, a, as a player. Yeah, and and the harmonies, Jimmy, I think was probably the most educated of, uh, if you will. I don't know if he went to Berkeley. He went somewhere. He might. Jeff went to Berkeley. I think Jeff Sipe did to go to Berkeley for a year or so. But Jimmy had, had had full degree in music and all this stuff. Jimmy Herring, speaking of, and yeah. um, a lot of what he said. And 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 here again, here's a, a, a redneck from Cumming, Georgia, who who don't have the background to understand a lot of what was said. You just find a way to. And he also, let's look at it from his point of view. Here's an educated guy. Here's Mozart, you know, playing music with Bucka White. Is that is that going to work? Uh, it could. It could. But only if both give a little mm-hmm. bit, right? So, you know, I, I didn't do a lot of study, and I, I sure wish I would have had. But a lot of the musics that the Aquarium Rescue did play were, were rooted music, uh, blues-based music, bluegrass, yeah. blues Jump jazz, not really hard jazz. We didn't do much hard jazz. We did more of um, uh, your Benny Goodman type approach to jazz, which is blues, 12 bar blues with a few extra things going on. Right. right. You got yeah. your diminished stuff. You got your, your whole tone stuff and you can fool a lot of people. <laughs> Right, and and you you know you essentially play or sing the head, and then you blow over it, yes. right? Every, you know, yeah, and and being familiar with that with blue, with bluegrass, same thing. So yeah. you're going to play Foggy Mountain Breakdown. The banjo player is going to play the dang melody, and we're going to come in there and and do different things with that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I every day I'm I'm thankful that I was able to spend three. I guess about three and a half years with those guys. And and here again, that's that's gonna rub off on you for yes. better or worse. <laughs> Absolutely. Washington, Lincoln, Jackson. Susan B. Anthony. <laughs> I think the first time I ever heard the name or read the name Matt Mundy, as you're talking about reading like liner notes, the first time I ever saw your name and heard you play was not with Bruce. It was actually when you played on that Bela Fleck album. How about that? Tales from the Acoustic Planet. How about that? I I still have heart problems from when Bela called me to ask me to (laughs) to play on that. Did you about (laughs) fall on the floor? (laughs) I did. I learned some dance moves I didn't didn't know I could do. <laughs> what was that experience so, like? So, Bela got in, and and here again, it's cringe worthy to use the word jam band. From what I understand, everybody that I hear of saying that, it's a cringe. It's, it's be careful using that term, right? But it's it was it's it is a thing now. Now they even think called jam grass. Believe it or not. So, mm-hmm. so your jam bands got really popular again after Grateful Dead Almond Brothers being the the big dogs, if you will, uh, 90, 91, 92, somewhere around that time period, they say jam band music started. Fish, Aquarium Rescue Unit, uh, Blues Traveler, and and our mentors also who really pulled us towards that seat, got us a lot of breaks was widespread panic, period. Yeah. We wouldn't have we wouldn't have got a record contract and probably never played Red Rocks and this without Widespread. So anyway, enter Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tons. I think they really capitalized on the jam band scene. So they come on on the jam. A lot of their crowd all of a sudden were were people looking for something different as as three minute bluegrass song. And Bela can do that, right? Yes. He can do a song that's uh, that's not a bluegrass song and play it for ten minutes. Yeah. So they started coming around and playing shows with us. And, and we did a tour called the Horde Tour, which the first was 92, then we did 93. Well, 93, the Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones were on that tour. I may have that backwards. Maybe they were 92. So I met Bella then. I met Bella on that tour, and we got to be pretty good friends pretty quick because at that time, I think he was reaching out. He had been in the bluegrass world for 15, 20 years previous, and so when he started his band, 
you know, all of a sudden he was in maybe in, in territory where he didn't have the camaraderie with a lot of different musicians, different feel for him, maybe being in mm-hmm. the rock, rock world, if you will. So I met him on the tour. We got to be buddies and we jammed a few times and made friends. So after I'd quit Bruce in August of 93, he calls later in 93 saying, I'm doing an album, you know, Sam Bush. And here's the punchline is I played second string to Sam Bush. Go figure. <laughs> Sam Bush broke his hand, broke his hand. And they had a session booked with Warner Brothers at some, I can't remember the studio, big studio in Nashville. And they can't change that date. So Sam Bush breaks his hand. And so here I am completely floored and honored, but he called me of all the mandolin players that he knows that he could have hired to sub for Sam to play on these songs that, that he had, was recording. So it was supposed to be two. And then when I got there, he went ahead and included me on another one. So it was three songs on that album. Man. Yeah. I remember hearing that and it's like right out of the gate. I mean, that, that first, I think you, I think maybe the first tune, I think you were playing on that. What's first that tune. in seven? Dun, 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 yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. yeah, which I had had a little experience playing odd time because Jeff Sight taking it back to that they love to play odd time stuff. So I I didn't know any odd time going into the aquarium rescue unit. So there was some good foundation there. Was learning yeah. meter different meter times. So yeah, that that is a cool tune. Cool tune. Yeah, and, and just- Bela recording. Wow, it's so open. So here's the format. You're going to play this solo. You're going to play this. Solo. He didn't tell you what to play. He he said you play. If it, you know, you play what you want to play. If you was in context. bunch of freedom to give somebody and did that did that make you feel more at ease or more terrified well yeah i was prepared so i'd went up to his house a couple of times previously and uh he showed me the tunes because it's not something it's not four chords it's not three chords you know he's got some funny stuff going on in there yeah so i had to go up and prepare so when i came hey <laughs> i knew who was on the session i was prepared yeah okay to some degree uh, but open that wide open. I was in the booth right next to here again, my hero, Tony Rice. So I was really nervous about that. So the first tune that it went good. There's another tune. Let's see. How's it go? Um, Da, 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 oh yeah. Da, 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 da. Okay. So that's Tony and I play the first little rhythm riff on that. Where I think it goes to E E minor to an F major. Mandolin just shifts up, but I was rushing. I was rushing it. There's no click track going on on this. So right? they didn't, none of that no, was recorded with a click. Not to my recollection, there was no click track. Uh, I was rushing it. And I, Tony was right beside me. And I just, I felt that huge pocket mm-hmm. that Tony had. had. And it's just like, okay, so I know what I got to do. I got to pull all the way back. Yeah. That was the, the only thing that I took away from it is being off like a little nervous. Yeah. was was being i couldn't pull that all the way back to where it needed to be i was wanting to play it too fast and rushed so i felt the the fact that you had dropped that drop that first part and just fall back into it type thing yeah. cool cool if you will be cool right there you know? right and that was tony rice i could i could hear what he was doing this huge huge pocket
Was that the first time you'd ever played with him? I did do a, a festival with Tony uh, late 93 uh, with the Tony Rice unit. Yeah, I played a few songs up, up on stage with him. So oh it wasn't the first gosh. time, but it's, uh, I guess, the most intimate, I guess you'd yeah. say. Yeah. That is crazy. Yeah, and Tony was losing his voice at this time. So Tony had something wrong with his, what do you call it, a deviated septum? Does that mm-hmm. sound right? Yeah. So uh, he was losing his voice around this time that he was recording with Bela. So he, I don't know if it had anything to do with it or not, but his, his guitar really sparkled. I mean, just so do you lose your voice and all of a sudden you got to step up your game a little bit on your guitar, right? Right. <laughs> so he was tearing it apart. Man, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so who all was on that session? Of course, the Wooten Brothers. Of course. Um, Paul McCandless. Are you familiar with Paul McCandless? Oregon? Oregon, yeah. Wow, wow that, that's a career highlight for me. Yeah, because he played player. He played oboe. So who plays oboe in, in, a, in a band? Not too many people. And it, and it was worked just, really well. Oh, man, just a beautiful tone, right? Yeah. Yeah, and there was there was several others that played, but but that's a career highlight for me. Paul McCandless. I had, Bruce was friends with him, so I'd met him a time or two uh, previously. May have even sat in with us at some point. Wow. Yeah. And I think did Chick Corea play on that? Rep? I mean, it was a duo thing, I believe. Bruce I think Hornsby that, did. I know yes, Bruce Hornsby did. was on there. I'm not sure if Chick was on that or not. Yeah, I remember Hornsby. And Branford Marsalis, Mm -hmm. not in the studio when I was in there, but when I was in there, there was enough to give a person a small heart attack. (laughs) No kidding. Okay. Funny. Tony Rice leans over and says, Hey buddy, I ain't seen you long talking to someone in the sound booth. I didn't know who it was. We continued with the session. And uh, so after the cut, we go back in the studio and I look up and it's Vassar Clements. What? Vassar Clements was in the studio and uh, hero. To everyone, everyone. I mean, anybody out there that don't know who that is, I'm sorry, you don't know <laughs> who that is. Uh, so I got to be in the presence of Vassar Clements once. I, I, that's another career wow. highlight for me. He, I, I bet you they would have liked to have had him on the session. It didn't work out because a lot of times they do that. Somebody just show up and he goes out and plays a solo on it or something. Yeah. Stuart Duncan was there covering fine fiddle that day. Just, just fine, fine fiddle. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the fast forward, uh, I, I do want to. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit with this story because Mark has told it to me, and it just left such an impact on me. About years later, you go into uh, you guys go in to hear Chris Thiele play, and Chris asking you all to come backstage and talking to you about you playing on that album and how much it just changed the game for him and just the the seeds that you planted in these young players that you probably didn't even realize you were doing at the time. And it's pretty amazing to, to hear the impact that that had on, on people like Chris. Too sweet. Yeah. Yeah. How easy is is it to be arrogant and um, nose up in the air a little bit uh, at that caliber? And he's not, he's just the super I'm, I'm talking about just made you feel at home, you know? Yeah. So we, we went backstage Got asked to come back there. We was walking out, and I was—I had had some wine, Brad. Okay, we'll leave it there. And even funnier, I'll back. I'll tell you the rest of the story. Here. So we go back. We're talking to him and meet him, and we go over. You know, oh, yeah, he said, oh, "I love your stuff on Bella's album, all this." And I said, "Well, oh, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that." <laughs> Uh, and I said, what what kind of mandolin? I, I noticed she was playing a lore. What year's your lore? They, the, Lloyd Lore's, for those out there that play saxophone, might not know that Lloyd Lore was worked for Gibson, and he made, designed, actually didn't make anything, but designed the, the premier mandolins, 1922, 1923, and four. That was the what's still made as, as the... Uh, as the uh, benchmark mandolin now. So I said, Chris, what, what year's your lore? And I think he said it was 24 and I made 1920 and just reaches in his case and hands it to me. <laughs> okay. Well, Terry, my sister-in-law had butted it into me while I was drinking wine. Listen, I had wine all over my shirt and hand, right hand. So here I, he hands me his Lord, Lord, I, my hands are so sticky. I can't play it. Right. <laughs> so he hands it to me. And I, of course I didn't think of it, think till later about that. But anyway, I, I Let's me play his mandolin. I got pictures of me playing his mandolin with him standing there and showing him all these hot licks is what it amounts to. I was showing him all these licks he <laughs> needed to add to his next show. <laughs> yeah. So 
you know, I, I, that just made an impact on me. You know, who's going to, these are $250,000 mandolins. So he's just going to, I ask, what's your mandolin? What kind of, he just hands it to me. I thought that was something, you know. Yeah, super, super nice fellow. I haven't seen him since, but he's, he's been in town. I actually did see him, I, not him personally, but we went to see his uh, solo show at the Symphony Hall where it's just him. <laughs> he walks out with a mandolin and there, I guess the Symphony Hall has microphones throughout the hall on so but there was nothing on his it was just the mandolin you know there was no marshall stack behind him or anything <laughs> and it was unbelievable two hours he did the play the sold out show at the uh, symphony hall he is he is a force uh, yeah i don't think I've, I've seen recent videos of him on youtube or something uh, there is no better there is no, no. better and, and through hundreds of years there's there's been no better no, he's 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 something special. Um, I'm a big fan of a piano player named Brad Meldow. I'm familiar. Yeah, yeah, and they did an album together, just mm-hmm. a duo album that is, it's just top notch. Michael Days was who the show was at mm-hmm. the at Atlanta it was a Smith So Smith So Bar, and there again it was one microphone, two singing, and two instruments, and they were cracking glass on the back wall of that place. It was really? un, it was just top notch. Amazing. Yeah, really awesome play. Well, I'll confess to you now uh, that the day that I'm, the first day that I ever played with Mark and Jody at the music store. I remember that. Came up there. Um, Y'all played Georgia Rose. We sure did. And I, you played with us. And as excited as and fired up as I was in that moment of getting to play with them, I will confess to you now that I was completely terrified that I was playing music with Matt Mundy because I have Gosh. just always just you have been one of my heroes from the first moment I ever heard you Brad, play. That's too much. Too <laughs> much. Well, you needed the problem is you y'all needed a mandolin chop. You had two guitars and you were trying out on bass. That's you right. You had to have the chop in there. We had make, to have that two and four, and thank goodness you were there. Put you I, in your place. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it was amazing. It was amazing. Well, you got well, the gig. I yeah, do know that's that. It. You you and played million shows with them now. That's it. And hopefully I've, still more in the future too, that's right? Ex- ex- I hope so too. Yeah. I um uh, you know, they turned out to be some meeting some of my like meeting my extended family. That's the way it, that's what happened that day. You they know? had had some bass players that were good. And then we'll refer to them as as strag- stragglers, stragglers that played bass. But when you came on board, they also had a harmony singer. Mm. They had someone who could hit those high notes and, mind you, cover lead, give Jody a break. But they had that tenor that made a trio. And trio, a lot of people don't, in a band, is a dang instrument. A trio is an instrument. If that's strong, the band's strong, right? That trio's everything. Yeah, I I tell everybody that it was... To me, and there's it, there's such great playing as as you, I know you know with your with Mark and everything, but when the three of us got together, it became a vocal band right. that also had good playing in it, right. and and I take such pride in in what we've what we've gotten to do together over the years. You know? Yes. You Did know. you ever listen to much of the Osborne Brothers with oh, Bobby absolutely. and Sonny Osborne? Yes. So they had the they they rearranged bluegrass music with their vocals, you know, putting the lead on top mm-hmm. and stacking under. You know, even Bill Monroe, I think he he did the high lead, but there there would be a tenor going on also. Right. Maybe he had dropped down and for the tenor. Kind but of, the yeah, Osborne Brothers when hearing. they came on, that high voice was was out front. Yeah. Right. And Bobby Osborne, the best. The Bobby. best. Yeah. I, absolutely. The, he brought I, it every best. night. He's so strong. So strong. Yeah, I love to hear that, how the harmony parts can either flank the lead vocal or the stacking the lead vocal, the, the high on the lead vocal on top or moving it around. I, it's I just, like a double high, too. You get a good baritone lead singer and get the, the tenor, which is not too high. Then you got a high baritone over that. That's a cool sound, too. I agree. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah, it's just it, – yeah, it just – you're singing this it's the same chords if you will but yeah. voicing it's just like on any instrument some of voicing the JD, them differently jd you know? crow in the new south stuff. mom turned me on to that actually early was uh the way that the baritone would do just that so the lead singing his part you got a baritone under a tenor and then certain words within a phrase that baritone comes over the lead if the lead drops down for a low then the baritone 
grabs that tenor. And then there is two parts above the lead just for a, for a word or two and then yeah. drops right down. So you're inner switching. We're getting, we're getting into, uh, what is, what is the, um, take six. We're going to be the take six of bluegrass here. Right? Take six. <laughs> quick, quick side note. I went to see take six in concert at the Fox when I was wow. 14. That was my 14th birthday gift from my mom and the opening band on their First or second tour was Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones. Is that right? Yeah. As I seen a recent video of, of Stevie Wonder with Take Six. Oh, so I've they're seen still that. out there. I didn't know that, but I seen a recent video, and that was pretty darn cool. They were. They are just. How can you make? I'm I'm used to third harmonies. You know, being bluegrass and country music in general, it's a lot of third harmonies, mm-hmm. right? One, three, five. Uh, how do you get six people to make a harmony where they're not on the same note? Not on the same note, and there's and to, they're so the some of those intervals are so close together, and okay. they're just so half in tune. Steps, half yeah. steps. But yeah. then you think, well, piano, you know, piano's got ten. You know, yeah, I guess you could right. have take ten. By gosh, if you wanted to. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> right. Well, before we go, uh, I just want to tell you how much I honor and appreciate you spending some time with me today and i'm anytime i'm glad you're you're out there sharing your your gifts with everybody and and passing on your knowledge to your students and still uh, playing yeah i keep a handful of students i i love it i you know teaching is um something that i've done down through the years at times but later in life i'm 55 now so having the three or four students they'll come to me and 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 want to learn something and I have to, you know, you're used to old Joe Clark or banjo tune, anything. When I play it, I'm going to play it at 120 beats a minute, something blah, 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 like this. Well, they're going to learn it. Well, they're not going to learn it at 120 beats. They're going to learn it their way down here. So you have to stop. You have to slow all the way down. Mm-hmm. So therefore, you're essentially learning it again yourself yeah. as a teacher. So teaching is very valuable, not just for the for them, but for you also I as agree. a player. I've spent a lot of time over the years teaching private students, and you learn a lot about your own playing by having to explain it to somebody else. When yes. you have to, you have to, you have to justify why you're telling them to do it. Well, that you're way. seeing a different, different the prism of it, different perspective. Yeah, of the same thing that you quote quote already know. You're you're teaching it like you. <laughs> oh yeah, I know that. Right. Right. Yeah, but what. <laughs> I don't get on to them. I don't get on to them, but they'll come the next week and I will have showed them a little something and they don't quite got it, you know, and we'll do it again. We'll, we'll start there again to try to try to show. And I, I, I tell them in a jokingly way, I said, well, I'll show you this again, but now it's going to cost you another $50. <laughs> <laughs> if that's okay, I'll show you, <laughs> I'll show you next week again, again. but I got to have some tennis shoes out of this deal. So, <laughs> You see how that works. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> oh, man. Well, Matt, I can't thank you enough, buddy. Absolutely, and, uh, Brad. And good to I, see you. I, these people can only hear, but I can see you. You look That's right. Good. That's back at you. It's and, good to see I, you. And face. I see the Pac Man game behind you here again. I, I like that. Yeah. I'm, uh, you're in your, uh, your, uh, I'm in my basement, media our game room. room. Yes, game our room. media room. Um, uh, and, uh, We'll get together and play some Galaga together sometime. Uh, well, let's just play music. How about that? All right. That sounds good. All right, buddy. Best of luck. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad, very much. Yeah.